can be a good day. Okay, so, you know, I have the, these things broken down by objectives, and these are all the same as the um, SOPEAK objectives, right? I mean, like, I don't know if you've noticed, if you've gone through the SOPEAK syllabus, all of the objectives that are in your course outline and all of the objectives in the Pan Global are all SOPEAK objectives. That's how the textbook and that's how the course is broken down. So, and so, you know, if I use a PowerPoint, that's kind of how I um, broke it up too. So, scope of CSA, ASME, ANSI, ASTM codes and standards, uh, power piping code and process piping code. Boy, there's a lot of stuff. Let's just break this down into little bitty chunks. The CSA is a Canadian code. And in particular, it's the B51. That's the one that's for boilers, pressure vessels, and pressure piping. Okay, and so the way that it works is because CSA is a Canadian code. It really supersedes all of the other codes and standards that are referenced, including the ASME. But what it does is it references many, many codes, including the ASME, and you know about that one, uh, Boiler Pressure Vessel Code. But um, there's something specifically with regard to boilers uh, that we don't find in the Boiler Pressure Vessel Code. So that would be the ASME Power Piping Code. And the Power Piping Code is B31.1. And that's where we find information about blow-off piping, feed water piping, uh, instrumentation piping. I think the main ones here uh, would have to be boiler, uh, blow-off, and feed water. Um, most important information that we find about it. Okay, so for example, what kind of valve can you use? Uh, what kind of piping can you use? What kind of design considerations do we have to take into account for blow-off piping? Now, there's also another uh, ASME uh, called the Process Piping Code that we're going to look at. And the Process Piping is um, the B31.3. So here's the thing is all of the, the uh, pressure piping codes start with the letter B and uh, they're all 31s. And then there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine type of deal. So for example, I think point nine is refrigeration uh, piping, this type of stuff, you get the idea. So this is all part of the pressure piping code. It is not the same as a boiler pressure vessel piping code. Now, if you wanted to kind of relate these to the ASME, you could kind of say that power piping is really kind of related to uh, ASME 1 because it's really about boilers and steam piping, high pressure steam piping, that type of stuff. And if I was to do the same thing to the process piping code, I would say that it's kind of related uh, to uh, ASME 8. These are really crude uh, comparisons, really. But ASME 8 is pressure vessels. And so uh, the pressure uh, or process piping uh, code uh, cover stuff like all kinds of pressurized fluids other than steam. <clears throat> ANSI itself is not a code and standard organization. It's the American National Standards Institute. And so what they do is they support um, all of the various ASME codes and CSA codes and whatever. And uh, they... Um, assist the organizations in developing things which are U.S. national standards. So that's really what they do. They develop U.S. national standards. And uh, as for the ASTM, again, ASTM does not make codes. ASTM tests materials. And you know about that. That's why they're called the American Society for Testing of Materials. 
okay? <laughs> Which just kind of drives me crazy. Um, they develop tests. So here, you know, ABSA, SOPEAK, Pan Global uh, talks about ASTM codes. There are no ASTM codes. There are ASTM procedures. Uh, there are ASTM material specifications, uh, but there are no ASTM codes. So let's take a look more now at the B-51. Boilers, pressure vessels, pressure piping, fitting, and interesting, weld procedures. So weld procedure is um, basically a recipe for baking a cake. But in this case, the cake is a weld. So what it has is a whole bunch of uh, variables. And the variables are, um, they can be very, very important, or they can be kind of, you know, not that important, right? So what we have is essential variables. And then we've got uh, what we call non-essential variables. So the, uh, essential and non-essential. There's even something called the supplementary essential variable, but I'm not going to go there. So if you think about essential variables for baking a cake, you'd say, well, how much flour? How much water? How much baking soda? How much baking powder? Okay, very, very essential for baking a cake. And a non-essential would be, do I put food coloring on it? Do I put icing on it? That type of thing. So, uh, you know, do I like just a couple of walnuts in my in my brownies, or do I like lots of walnuts, or do I don't like walnuts in my brownies at all? So that would be like a non-essential variable. Well, we, when we take a look at a weld, there are certain things that are essential, and there are certain things that are non-essential. Um, and what we do then is we get an engineer a weld engineer, which is a specialized type of mechanical engineer who designs a weld procedure. And what CSA says is that weld procedures must all be according to CSA B51. Crazy. So you can't just put a coat hanger in a, in a, in a welding machine and go spray weld metal all over the pipes in your plant or all over your boiler. No, there must be a weld procedure and there must be a qualified welder who's conducting that procedure. So what does CSA B51 say about boilers, pressure vessels, pressure piping? It says they must uh, all be registered designs. And I think that uh, you may know about this. Like, so for example, uh, every boiler and pressure vessel has a CRN, um, and the CRN would be, say, um, A1227.1, um, <clears throat> So here's the way that that works. Um, that and that are basically just like catalog numbers. Now, I was an inspector and, uh, you know, in Manitoba, of course, we would have to review uh, designs and we would have to issue Canadian registration numbers to a design that's found satisfactory in the province of Manitoba. And if it was a new design that hadn't been registered in any other province, um, we, we would have to issue a suitable design with a number. And uh, my very first time I'm doing this, I said to my boss, I said, Terry, where do I get the numbers from? He says, it's in that book over there. I open up the book and <laughs> the book was like A1225, A1226, A1226. So it's just basically a number that's the next number in whatever the series is. So it's meaningless, but what it is, is it's unique to a particular design, okay? 
then the rest of these numbers after the decimal point are important. That's the first province of registration. Those are all of the other provinces of registration. So the first province of registration in this case would have been Ontario, and then it would have been registered in BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. So what this means is you cannot install, you cannot use, you can't do anything with a boiler, pressure vessel, or pressure piping system unless it is a registered design. So let's say you went down to the USA, southern Texas somewhere, and you found yourself a great big used boiler, and it's not a registered design for use in Canada. Well, you brought it back to Canada, and you could have it sit in your garage if you wanted. You could put it in your backyard. You just couldn't put any water into it, and you couldn't fire it. You couldn't use it as a boiler. Unless you contacted the jurisdiction and say, hey, look, I brought in this boiler from out of province, and I want to get this thing uh, inspected. It's a non-CRN vessel. So if your intention is to get this thing a CRN, you would have to uh, contact the manufacturer, and you'd have to get all of the design information in, I think, triplicate. So all of the design calculations have to be submitted to the jurisdiction. They review the design and the design calculations, and they make sure that it's suitable for use in the jurisdiction. And if it's okay, they issue a CRN. Now, if a boiler has, say, issued that information to Ontario first, which they often do because Ontario is a big manufacturing heartland for, for Canada, um, Ontario will give it the number five. If it goes to Alberta first, it be A1227.2. First province of registration. Now then, after they have this thing registered in um, Ontario, then they go, oh, you know, we, there's a company in BC that wants to use this design too. So then what they would do is they'd go through the entire registration process now in British Columbia and get the number one. And then they say, well, I want to use it in Alberta too. So then they would uh, send it to Alberta. They send all of that design uh, information. Eventually, once they have all of the provinces, uh, they can shorten this because there's a lot of number stamping on a nameplate. And so once it's been registered in every single province, it'll be A1, 2, and territory, I should say. Every province and territory, it would get this. A1227.5C. So that's in a nutshell what's going on with Canadian registration numbers. And once you get a CRN, you can build any number of those boilers or pressure vessels or pressure piping systems or fittings or safety valves, or whatever it is you're building, you can build any number of them to that design. You can build a million of them a, a day if you want to, okay? Uh, so what we're doing is we're not registering every single boiler we're registering the boiler design. Now, sometimes a boiler manufacturer alters the design, they change it. And as soon as they change it, <clears throat> that requires a new uh, Canadian registration number. That's kind of the CSA B51 in a nutshell. So, um, these are all of the, the uh, symbols that you find behind the decimal point. YTN, N is for Nunavut, T is for Northwest Territories, Y for Yukon, and then the rest is just the provinces from, um, from west to east. <clears throat> One, two, three, Manitoba is four, Alberta you can see is two, Ontario is five, Quebec is six, um, New Brunswick is seven. Here's your geography lesson for today, right? Nova Scotia is eight. Little Prince Edward Island is nine. And not to offend anybody from Newfoundland and Labrador, but that's Newfoundland and that's Labrador. It's one province and uh, it gets the number zero. Now, the next one is the B31.1, B31, I should say, pressure piping code because here's there's 12 of them. 
okay? We're not going to worry about L12. We're going to look at these two here, with this one here really being the most important for power engineers. Um, then, you know, it's nice to know that there's a um, refrigeration piping code. I thought it was 31.9, it's 31.5. And uh, then there's building services piping. And this is when you get into places like if you work at uh, SAIT in the powerhouse. Uh, so building services would be like compressed airlines, um, uh, hot water, uh, heating, glycol heating, circulation piping. So that's what they call building services piping. <clears throat> so these are all the power piping codes and uh, specific, or pardon me, they're the pressure piping codes. But these are two of the main ones, 31.1 and 31.3. So what's in the power piping code? Basically the stuff you find in power generation uh, stations, industrial institutional plants. Basically we're talking about power plants that generate uh, high pressure steam. And we're gonna look at a little diagram in a bit. Um, and uh, so this one here is gonna be what we call boiler external piping and non-boiler external piping. As for the process piping, you know, here we are in the heartland of oil and gas, so petroleum refineries, chemical, pharmaceutical, textile, pulp and paper, semiconductor, cryogenic plants, basically processing plants. So then the next is uh, methods of pipe manufacture. Okay, so we know that uh, from ASME 2D, when we look up a piping specification, that uh, it says product form is one of the columns and it might say seamless pipe it might say welded pipe and so we know that both of those types of pipe exist so we'll just uh, take a very brief look at some of the stuff that i think was covered last year hot piercing extrusion and then we'll take a look at roll forming, ERW, and furnace butt welded. Now your textbook goes into uh, a few more other than these uh, methods. And my God, I mean, how many methods do you want to cover? Uh, this stuff here is the main, main manufacturing methods you see here on this screen. So if it's seamless, uh, one of the ways we do it is we pierce a hot billet. So here you can see this smoking hot billet of, of round steel. It's been forged into that round shape and they're literally forcing it over this thing here, which is called a mandrel. And the mandrel has a particular length. I can't recall how long they are. Uh, maybe it would vary from facility to facility, but here's what happens is the pipe gets forced, actually the round metal, gets forced over top of the pierced mandrel, and the length of the mandrel determines how long the length pipe is. So um, what we get is a non-continuous length. And so, so this here is a schematic or a diagram of what's going on in the picture. And for larger pipes, then what they'll do is they'll um, they'll also enlarge it to its final um, final thickness and uh, and uh, diameter. <clears throat> now then, there's another way that you can make a fairly uh, continuous length. Instead of a, a length that's dis dictated by the size of a mandrel, uh, what we can do is take a hunk glowing super, super hot steel, and we're going to put it inside of here. And then there's something called a die. Okay, and the die has a hole in it. And sticking out through the hole is a mandrel. But the mandrel does not dictate the length of the pipe. It's just occupying the center of the hole. 
So then we take this super duper hydraulic ram, lots of hydraulic uh, pressure, and we force, we squeeze this hot billet of steel through that annular space, and what comes out is a pipe. Now, then as we kind of get toward the end, you know, the ram is pushed in, we'll pull out the ram, put another smoking hot billet of steel in there. And what happens is each billet welds onto the next from the force. It basically gets forge welded within this block here. And uh, what we end up with is a continuous uh, length of extruded seamless pipe. So what we end up with, it doesn't matter whether we're hot piercing or whether we're extruding, we end up with what's called a seamless type S pipe. And we've seen that when we've seen, say, SA53 SB pipe. Well, the S means that it's ASME. A means it meets an ASTM designation. As a matter of fact, this is ASTM A53 pipe. It is grade B, which is probably a little bit stronger than grade A. And the S stands for seamless. So if we've got a seamless pipe, uh, if we're using PG, 27.2.2, the capital letter E, which stands for longitudinal joint efficiency, it's one. Okay, so there's no strength penalty for a welded seam. Uh, this stuff here is seamless. So the assumption is that the parent metal and the longitudinal joint have the exact same strength. And of course, there is no longitudinal joint, so they have to. Um, and so this starts off with a flat piece of steel. This uh, steel that you can see here uh, used to be flat, and it has a special name, and um, they use this in the textbook, so you should know what scalp is. So scalp is flat, uh, but it is to the particular, well, here. <clears throat> So um, circumference is equal to pi d. And I know what my particular diameter of the pipe is. So then uh, what I do is I determine the circumference, which is in fact, uh, here's my scalp. That is c. Right, I mean, the circumference is now laid out as a flat plate. And then what I do is I put it through rollers and I turn it into a cylindrical form. And then I have to weld the longitudinal uh, joint. <clears throat> now, this will produce longer lengths. Really, it depends upon how long is the scalp. And uh, you may see occasionally on a truck, you'll see these big coils of steel uh, that maybe weigh, I don't know, 10,000 pounds or something like that. And uh, if you can imagine that as being a coil of flat steel, well, then that's the scalp. And however long it is rolled up is how long you can make a length of pipe. Typically, what we get are 21 foot lengths. because they cut them to that length. <clears throat> so this is a cheap method. Uh, it takes a lot less uh, energy uh, than it does to hot pierce or extrude. Uh, it's also it's fast. <clears throat> now the welding, if it's thin pipe, is going to be done with electric resistance welding or furnace butt welding. And if it's thick pipe, it'll be done with submerged arc welding, the same like they do with a pressure vessel or a boiler 
Uh, we learned last year about sub arc welding, submerged arc welding, and they'll do the same thing with uh, pipe if it's thick, um, thick enough to require multiple passes. A uh, thin pipe is done in a single pass using electrical resistance welding or furnace butt welding. So let's take a look at pipe F pipe. The F stands for furnace butt welded. And um, what that means, what was I going to say? Uh, if I have a material like SA53 uh, grade FB, okay, we know that A53 is the ASTM designation. S is for what ASME calls it. Um, the B is the grade of material, but the F stands for type F pipe, which is furnace butt welded. And this is really, it's forge welding. This is the stuff that the blacksmith did, um, you know, a hundred years ago with a hammer and a forge. And what it makes is a weak weld. There has been talk over the years, is ASME going to ban this stuff? And ASME has never banned it. They still refuse to ban it. But what they do is they impose a 40% strength penalty. So think of this. SA53, um, SB pipe has a longitudinal joint efficiency of one because it's seamless. But SA53 grade FB has a, a longitudinal joint efficiency of only 60%. So this stuff here is considered only 60% strong uh, as the seamless. And so as a designer, you have to make a choice. Um, do I want to have um, a seamless pipe? If I have a seamless pipe, it's going to be more money, may uh, allow us to use a thinner pipe. So we can maybe use schedule 40 instead of schedule 80. And if we can use schedule 40 instead of schedule 80, then what we find is that the pipe is going to be a little bit lighter and, uh, and you know, maybe the pipe hangers don't have to be as robust or what have you. Because this is a, a design choice, whereas if somebody goes to here and they decide, oh, I'm going to use SA53 furnace butt weld pipe, they might actually have to go up a pipe size because they're going to have to larger uh, wall thickness. So instead of, you know, schedule 80 three-quarter inch pipe, someone's going to say, well, my my opening, my little hole in the middle is too small. Now I got to go to one inch pipe, schedule 80 stuff. So let me put it this way. To make a long story short, it's hard to find it. It's hard to find type F pipe. If you order it, you're going to be waiting a long time and you're going to be a fool because this stuff is garbage. Don't use it. It's bad. Then we get to this stuff here, which is kind of in the middle, ERW pipe. Uh, instead of this getting a, what was it, 40% strength penalty, this stuff here, because it's welded only, uh, but it's a better weld, uh, gets a 15% strength penalty. Um, it's less, uh, less expensive than type S. It's lower quality. It's very, very common um, for people to use uh, ERW pipe. So anyway, here you can see uh, some scalp and the scalp is going through uh, this machine. It's already been rolled into a cylinder. And here you can see the longitudinal joint. And um, this here, see the cables? These are basically welding cables and they are conducting um, the electricity to the pipe with this band. So let's just say that that's positive. I don't know if it is, but I'm just going to say that's the positive electrode. And then these rollers here are, in fact, 
the other electrodes, negative electrodes. And then this here is just basically is turning uh, to roll the pipe through. And so what we get is the um, passing of current through here, uh, so much current uh, that it causes the edges of the, uh, of the longitudinal joint to liquefy and then re-solidify as a solid uh, longitudinal joint. Um, here's another picture. Uh, you can see uh, that the longitudinal joint has been electrically resistance welded and it's glowing. And you can see it, you know, really glowing there. So here is a pipe example just to kind of summarize um, seamless ERW and type F furnace butt weld. Each one of these is a grade A SA53 pipe and I'm going to compare their strength at a very um, same temperature, 40 degrees Celsius. So the allowable working stress of the seamless is 94 and a half megapascals. The allowable working stress <clears throat> for the ERW is 80.7 megapascals. The allowable working stress for furnace butt weld is 56 and a half uh, megapascals. So I want people to do a little bit of uh, math for me. Uh, take uh, 80.7 over 94 and a half. And then I want uh, other others to do this 56 and a half over 94 and a half. And tell me what you get. What do you, somebody got an answer here for this middle one? 80.7 over 94 and a half. 0.85 or 85 percent. 15% penalty, strength penalty, penalty. Okay, what about this bottom one here? 0.598. So that one's got a 40% penalty. People are wondering, why is he going here? This is boring. Okay, remember we look at ASME 2D to find the maximum allowable stress. So we can plug it into a formula like PG 27.2.2, which says T is equal to PD over 2SE plus 2YP plus C. Recall that that formula here is for drums, headers, and piping. And that's the topic. We're on piping. So uh, where do we get S from? We get S from ASME 2D. And here's a whole bunch of stress values. Depends whether it's type E, type S, type F pipe. The letter E, when we do a piping calculation, is always 1. It must be one. So even though I've said that this stuff here is 85% as strong or it has a joint efficiency of 0.85, even though I said that this one here has a joint efficiency of 60%, 0.6, you'd think that's E, E is 0.85 for type ERW pipe, and E is 0.6 for furnace butt welded pipe. Well, I gotta tell you, that may be true, but then what we're doing is compounding efficiencies. ASME 2D builds it into the stress values. And there are notes to ASME 2D that they say, guess what? Forget about using a, an efficiency factor for your pipe. Just use the number for S and always use one and we'll take care of the rest. And they've done that. They took care of the 0.85. They took care of the 0.6 by building it into the stress values that they list for the various materials. 
So because of that, if you are doing a piping calculation, E is always equal to one. Now you guys know about this thing here and you got that in your Pan Global uh, academic extract. And so, you know, it talks about this stuff, ODID. One of the things that often gets people is that ID is equal to OD minus two T. Sometimes people only subtract T when they're trying to find the inside diameter. Um, but see, we got a T here, we got a T there. So ID OD minus two T. And then there's that H thing, uh, which is the depth of thread. For threaded pipe, depth of threat. Now, notice that this end of the pipe, that's what we call plain end. And so maybe we weld up pipe, but this end here is obviously threaded. Depends on the method of attachment. So let's just compare these things here. So this is be schedule 80, schedule 40. And what you'll notice is the OD never changes. So notice that when the schedule changes, <clears throat> the outside diameter never changes. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, then we get to this thing, nominal pipe size, and nominal means only a name. You're not going to find the dimension that the pipe is anywhere on the pipe. So, here's NPF 12. 12 inches, it's not the inside diameter, it's not the outside diameter. But what it is, is it's a constant 12.75 outside diameter, and it doesn't matter whether it's schedule 80 or whether it's schedule 40. What changes is the wall thickness, not the outside diameter. And uh, so then the, the naming convention that you're going to notice on that chart that's in your Pan Global Academic Supplement is for NPS 12 and smaller, <clears throat> by the way, always a constant outside diameter regardless of schedule. But for NPS and uh, NPS 12 and 10 and NPS 6 and NPS, and this is the most of what you're going to see. The nominal pipe size refers to the nominal inside diameter. Crazy. <clears throat> so schedule 40, even though it has a nominal inside diameter of inches, <clears throat> it could be that big in an inside diameter. It could be that big, or it could be that big. Again, it's just nominal inside diameter. Uh, whereas once we get to larger pipe, NPS 14 and larger, the number refers to the actual outside diameter. So this particular one, uh, let's say if it's NPS 14, oops, NPS 14. If it's NPS, then this will have an actual outside diameter of 14 inches. So when people, when these companies are, you know, hot piercing pipe, right? It's this really, really hot pipe that comes out and it's got a particular set of dimensions as it comes out of the extruder or as it comes out of the mandrel, it's really, really hot. And we know what happens to hot things when they cool off. And so there will be a final uh, dimensional finishing when this pipe is cold. Uh, to try and make sure that it's the proper outside diameter and the proper wall thickness, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> but machines are machines. And uh, uh, they can uh, kind of fall out of uh, calibration. They can uh, wear out a little bit. They can, um, you know, maybe the pipe isn't uh, um, <clears throat> exactly straight on the mandrel or whatever. So there is uh, a tolerance on the thickness. Uh, and that tolerance comes from ASME to A. 
Now, you don't have 2A, so you're going to have to take my word for it. But ASME 2A is the actual uh, material specifications for every individual material. And ASME 2A um, will have, say, four pages of information about SA-53. What a manufacturer has to do to call it SA-53. What's its chemical composition? What's its strength? What's its yield strength? What's its this? What's its that? ASME 2A, and this is only an example, this is specifically with 53. Under 12.3, it says thickness. It says the minimum wall thickness at any point shall not be more than 12.5% under the nominal wall thickness specified. So in other words, what ASME 2A does, it permits an under tolerance. Okay, so for example, let's take a look at SA-53 uh, 2-inch DN-50 Schedule 40. DN-50 pipe has a wall thickness of 3.91 millimeters. This is from your academic supplement, from that chart. What that means is that the manufacturer can make the pipe as thin as 3.91 times 1 minus 0.125, uh, or 3.42 millimeters. So here you're a designer and you say I need pipe that's 3.91 millimeters thick. You've done the formula. You've done T is equal to PD over 2XE plus 2YP plus C. You've done that and you came up with 3.91 millimeters. And you look in the in the catalog and you go, well, look at that, schedule 42 inch pipe is exactly 3.91 millimeters. That's what I'm going to order. Well, you can't. Because when you receive the stuff, it might be as thin as 3.42 millimeters. Okay, so you have to anticipate as a designer, you have to build in an anticipation that what they send you is 12 and percent undersize. Okay, you have to expect the pipe to be thinner than the schedule says it's going to be. So let's say we are using PG 27.2.2. What we do is we take the design thickness and let's say in this case 3.91 millimeters was a design thickness. And let's say for this particular pipe, the manufacturer's tolerance is 12.5%. So that would be 1 minus 0 0.125. Um, actually, no, hang on a second. The calculated is 3.91 millimeters. So if you calculated 3.91 millimeters, you'd have to divide that by 0.875 and that would give you 4.46 millimeters. I don't look at these slides as much as I should, I guess, but it says here, let's say, for example, uh, I've uh, calculated a minimum thickness and it was 3.4 millimeters thick and the pipe was DM50. So then what I did was it, the manufacturer's tolerance in this case was 12.5%. So I take my 3.4, I divide it by 1 minus 0.125, which is 0.875, and I come up with 3.89 millimeters. So now what I do after I got the number, I have to consult uh, the chart. And I find that schedule 40 has a nominal thickness of 3.91 millimeters so it would be okay then to schedule to uh, specify schedule 40 pipe for that application because uh, 3.91 is thicker than the minimum design thickness uh, also with consideration of a 12 and percent under tolerance now they go through this in your textbook as well uh, maybe not in the exact same way, but they do the, discuss the same stuff. The next thing is materials. We're going to start with ferrous, and we know that ferrous has at least 50% uh, iron in it. 
And first, we're going to take a look at something that happens uh, with steel at high temperature. And um, if we take a look at that iron carbon uh, phase diagram again, something like, oh boy, I blew that one. Should be there. That's where that line should be. Um, and so here we've got percent carbon on the bottom, and here we've got different phases. So uh, we've got um, uh, ferrite and perlite, and here we've got perlite and cementite, and then here we've got uh, the lower critical temperature, and here we've got the upper critical temperature, and uh, above here we've got all austenite, And here we've got ferrite and austenite. And here we've got um, cementite uh, plus austenite. So here's the thing. We've got perlite. And if you recall, a perlite crystal has got layers of cementite and ferrite. It has that uh, Oreo cookie look. So let's make those dark bands there. That's cementite. And cementite, if you recall, is Fe3C, or also called iron carbide. So over here, you can see we've got cementite and perlite. And perlite has cementite in it. And here we've got ferrite and perlite. And the perlite has cementite in it. So keep that in mind that it really doesn't matter where we're at in terms of our range of carbon. We've always got cementite there whether it's found in the perlite or whether it's found just as cementite all by itself. So here's what happens. At a high temperature, over 425 degrees Celsius, the carbon that's found in cementite, whether it's the actual cementite or if it's the cementite that we find in perlite, it disassociates from the carbides Okay, in other words, the uh, carbides decompose and forming separate particles of free carbon or graphite. Now, remember, we saw graphite before in gray cast iron, and we said the graphite along the grain boundaries was what makes it uh, prone to fracture under tension. Okay, the graphite is weak under tension. So, over 425 degrees Celsius, Graphitization is the process whereby iron carbide reverts to graphite and causes a loss in strength and ductility. And that should say tensile strength. So really what this is saying is graphitization is a process whereby plain carbon steel becomes weak at high temperature over a prolonged period of time. So what is prone to that? Plain carbon steel, just low carbon, plain carbon steel. And this is normal stuff, right? So ASME2D says that plain carbon steel is not suitable for over 425 because graphitization occurs between 425 and 595. What do you need to know? You need to know what the word graphitization uh, means it means a formation of graphite because the uh, the cement is down. Uh, you should know 425 Celsius is being like a temperature limit for plain carbon steel. Now your Pan Global textbook says the graphitization occurs at 400. Anyway, I think it's just you know Pan Global is just pulled a number out of their butt and said 400 degrees. Sure, that sounds like a nice round number. But the point of the matter is that if you use a plain carbon steel up to 425, uh, you shouldn't have to worry about graphitization. But what if you want higher temperature service? Well, then we get into an alloy. Uh, and very common ones, chromoly. Um, they're creep resistant and they resist graphitization. <clears throat> now then there is the austenitic stainless steel, which we also use at high temperature. 
Uh, we use these for superheaters. We use them for reheaters. And we know a little bit about austenite. Austenite is face-centered cubic as opposed to ferrite, which was body center cubic. And just to recall, you know, here's my cube. And all these are little atoms, metallically bonded. Okay, but face center cubic has an atom on every face. So it's like, it's like a die, like dice, you know, roll dice, where every side has a one on it. And so austenite is face center cubic, and um, and according to the iron carbon phase diagram, we saw how steel is uh, polymorphic and allotropic, so it can actually change between different phases until you get up above the upper critical temperature, where everything is austenite, everything is FCC above the UCT as long as you're below the solidus, like as long as it's still solid and not liquid, okay, because obviously liquids have no crystal structure. <clears throat> but so anyway, high temperature above the UC temp UCT, we've got austenite. Wonderful. But then we get to normal operating temperatures. We get somewhere down here below 723 Celsius, and we've got ferrite and perlite. And we've got perlite and cementite. <laughs> well, how the heck at austenite below 723? It doesn't make sense. But you can. How do you get austenite at low temperature? What you do is you add lots of chromium and nickel. And then you get a steel which... If I was to draw my iron carbon phase diagram again, we have austenite, 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 austenite. It never changes its form. It always stayed, stays as FCC. So austenitic stainless steel is always face centered cubic. It does not go, uh, it does not have a phase change with temperature. So, you know what austenitic stainless steel is, okay? You might have heard of 304 stainless. You might have heard of 316 stainless. You've seen it. You've seen it on the distillation column upstairs uh, on the fourth floor. You've seen it on the pump priming lines on um, the, the pump lab. Uh, you've seen it uh, for the instrumentation uh, airlines for the boilers on the first floor, all of that stainless tubing is 304 stainless, or it's probably likely 316 stainless. In other words, all that stainless steel you see in the lab is austenitic stainless steel. Okay? So here's a material that we would use for high temperature strength and corrosion resistance. Okay, and you're going to hear that term over and over again throughout your career. You're going to hear about austenitic stainless steel. It does not undergo a phase change. It stays as face center cubic all the time due to the addition of alloying agents. Okay, now um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, boiler proper piping, boiler external piping, and non-boiler external piping. So here's boiler proper piping. And it's the little fine one. The boiler proper piping is this. It actually forms part of the boiler itself. So economizer, if it's an integral economizer, uh, superheater, that's boiler proper piping. Not much, okay? It's almost uh, very little of the boiler uh, piping is boiler proper piping <clears throat> then there is boiler external piping and the boiler external piping is the stuff i was showing you before that's boiler external piping basically it goes from the boiler to some something external and the boiler external piping goes up to that first required valve so 
there's the first required valve on this gauge glass. Um, here's the first valve, isolation valve on the continuous blow off. Uh, here is a vent line, first required isolation valve. So that's all boiler external piping, which is B31.1. And then the last one is non-boiler external piping. And non-boiler external piping is the stuff we think about in power uh, plants like a blow-off line, uh, drains, vents from superheaters, um, uh, steam uh, lines, okay? Um, feed water lines. Okay, all this feed water stuff, um, bottom blow off stuff. Okay, so this is a big majority of what we uh, look at, and this is all B31. So, my question is why does a Pan Global insist on using A section one for determining uh, piping uh, thickness? They can't. They're breaking the rules. Because almost everything that we do, as you can see, whether it's boiler external piping or non-boiler external piping, that is all under the, uh, uh, the design rules of B31.1. And you can see very little is actually uh, boiler proper piping. So if, you, if I've got like a big external downcomer, part of my boiler, I'm making it out of piping, then I use uh, um, ASC1. Everything else I got to use a B31.1. So this is, uh, you know, what code do I use? If it's boiler proper piping, the jurisdiction is ASME1, but the technical and the technical responsibility is boiler pressure vessel code section one. Examples, downcomers, risers, transfer piping, piping between the drum and an attached superheater. Now, boiler external piping is still under the jurisdiction of BPVC-1, but BPVC-1 hands it over to 31.1. That includes feed water, main steam uh, line, vent, drain, blow off, chemical feed piping. Okay, and then the NBEP is all under 31.1. Confusing, isn't it? So, why be confused? Let's just cut to the chase and, and simplify this. Here's BPVC1. This is PG 27.2.2. This is ASME B31.1. I can't remember what the clause is. But take a look at the formulas. T is equal to PD over 2SE plus 2YP plus C. TM is equal to PD sub O over 2 in brackets SE plus PY plus A. Wait a minute. Why didn't ASME1 take the 2 out of there, divide it out of each term, and have SE plus YP. They could have, the rats, but you see that this is exactly the same. These formulas are exactly the same, and C and A are also the exact same thing. They are uh, corrosion allowance, uh, additional structural stability allowance, or compensation for cut threads. It's the exact same thing. B31.1 just uses a different letter. So, to summarize then, if I have a piping question, do I really need to use B31.1? Not really. It's technically correct to do that. Um, can we, as a third class power engineer, Doing that calculation for an ABS exam? Absolutely. 
So let's take a look at some of the differences between ASME 1 and 31.1. Now, again, this is very, very similar. Uh, this one here says when steel pipe is threaded and used for steam pressures of 1.7 megapascals or over, which is 250 PSI, if you like thinking in uh, U.S. standard units. It shall be seamless and a weight equal to schedule 80. Okay, so over 1.7 megapascals, seamless, and uh, schedule 80. Whereas 31.1 says pressure pipe thinner than schedule 40 shall not be threaded. So the difference here is just simply seamless. They're saying the same thing. But these guys here say seamless. These guys don't. So uh, on boiler external piping and uh, boiler external piping do not have to be seamless. But the same requirement for threading, meaning that it has to be higher than uh, schedule 40. Pressure pipe thinner than schedule 40 shall not be threaded. Oh, okay, yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, PVC1 says schedule 80. This one here says it can't be uh, thinner than schedule 40. So there's two differences here. So what it's saying then is that 31.1 is more lenient than uh, ASME code section one. Now we think about boilers, we think that oh there should be something in the ASME code about uh, feed waters and blow off piping that type of stuff. It isn't. What happened was ASME code section one used to have that stuff and I think in the early 70s they shoveled, shoveled it over to the B31.1 power piping code. So what the power piping code says is that feed water piping and blow off piping, they have to be designed to a higher maximum allowable working pressure than the actual boiler because of severe service. It's also called shock service. And uh, so what we do then is once we calculate the maximum level of working pressure, we have to adjust it. So it's the mop plus 225 or 1.2 times the mop, 1.25 times the mop. We take the lower of those two. So let's say I got a boiler with a mop of 1,000 uh, kPa. When I'm designing the feed water or the uh, boiler blow off piping, I have to go either 1000 plus 225, or I've got to go uh, 1000 times 1.25. So that's 1250 versus uh, 1225. In this case, we select the lower of. But still, for the blow off and the feed water piping is a higher value than it is for the actual boiler that it feeds. And it's just because feed water and the blow off piping uh, take some beating uh, in, in operation. So they have to be designed uh, heavier duty. So we looked at PG9 before. This is in uh, Boiler and Pressure Vessel Code Section 1. And it says that pipes, tubes um, shall conform to one of the specifications. And then it says the stress values in these tables include the applicable joint efficiency factor for welded pipes and tubes. That's right from BPVC1. So it says that when we are using PG 27.2.2 for ca piping calculations, E must be equal to one. They build in 
the penalty for um, method of constructing the steel. Okay, we know about that one. Uh, now, PG 27.4.7 talks about that uh, nominal wall thickness. And it, this is where, where it says that you have to factor in the manufacturer's tolerance. And it gives you a little bit of procedure here. It says after calculating T, so once it's determined by formula, the minimum thickness shall be increased by an amount sufficient to provide the manufacturing tolerance allowed in the applicable pipe specification. And the only way you can get that is to go to ASME 2A and you don't have it. But if you were an engineer who designed this stuff all day, you'd look in ASME 2A to find out what is the manufacturing tolerance. But typically it's uh, plus or minus 12.5% for a lot of pipe. <clears throat> and then what you do is after you've uh, determined the increased thickness, uh, you select the next heavier commercial wall thickness. So here is a, an example problem for you. We got a downcomer. Well, downcomer is boiler proper piping. It's part of the boiler. It's designed for 12.5 megapascals. It's constructed of plain end, so it's not threaded. DN150SA106C pipe has a mean wall temperature not exceeding uh, 350 degrees Celsius. Let's find an S value. I don't have an S value for you, but if we knew what S was, we would go to PG 27.2.2. And we would find T is equal to PD 2SE plus 2YP plus C. In this case, because it's plain ended, uh, we're not going to put anything for C. Uh, for E, we don't have to worry about that because it's built into uh, the, uh, the actual stress value. And so if I knew the stress value, I know the MOP which is 12.5 megapascals. Um, as for D, that's the outside diameter, and I would have to get that from the pipe table. That's the one that you have in your, um, in your academic supplement. Um, Y we know is a temperature coefficient, so that would be 0 0.4. Um, and then we could just plug in the numbers. The main thing is where do you go to get the numbers? You've got to go to the piping table to get the outside diameter. You have to go to ASME 2D to get the allowable stress for the material at the temperature. Once you plug in everything, you're going to get a particular minimum design thickness, which is this one here. Then it says, determine the actual design thickness for manufacturers under tolerance at 12.5%. And then it says, select the appropriate pipe schedule. So in this case, the uh, design minimum thickness was 7.51 millimeters. And if I take 7.51, and I divide it by uh, 0 0.875, I end up with 8.59 millimeters. And then I have to go back to that uh, table in the Pan Global, the piping table. The academic supplement. And I would see that for DN150 pipe, uh, the next larger size, okay, schedule 40 would be too small. Okay, I think schedule 40 would be obviously below 8.59 millimeters, but schedule 80 is 10.97 millimeters thick, so it exceeds, it's the next larger uh, pipe size. Uh, I'm 
objective four. Okay, this is another thing that's well, this is boring as all shit. So cast iron. Do we see cast iron? Can we use cast iron? Well, ASME boiler pressure vessel code says uh, we can't use it for steam pressures above 1725 kPa. That's 250 psi. We can't use it for temperatures above 230 degrees Celsius either. We can't use it for blow off connections and we can't use it where a shock load may occur. And it also says that we can't use cast iron for nozzles or flanges that attach directly to the boiler. So here you can see a, a boiler steam drum with a fluid in manhole. And up here we can see a nozzle and maybe that, that's for a um, pressure relief valve or maybe it's a main steam outlet. I'm thinking that's for a pressure relief valve. And it's got a flange there. Now, uh, any kind of nozzle or flange that attaches directly to the boiler cannot be made of cast iron. Let's put it this way. In our business, we don't see cast iron on our high pressure steam boilers unless it happens to be a low water cutoff or water column. That's about it. Now, can you use copper or aluminum or something that's got, you know, something that's non-ferrous? Well, ASME BPVC1 says, that pipes or tubes that are non-ferrous shall not be used for blow-off piping or for any other service where the temperature exceeds 210. Again, non-ferrous materials are fairly limited. 31.1 says uh, water, pardon me, a non-ferrous pipe, copper and brass, uh, can be used for water and steam service to pressures not exceeding 1750 kPa or to design temperatures exceeding 208. Very, very similar. Maybe if you've got very uh, low pressure bore, so maybe you've got some kind of a Fulton uh, boiler that's used in a dry cleaning and it's operating at 80 PSI, uh, you might see uh, copper uh, and brass uh, blow off lines and stuff like that. But generally speaking, we don't see non ferrous ferrous materials used for boiler uh, pressure vessel service or for um, uh, steam service under ASME 31.1. Not very common. Look at this. Ah, different kinds of this admiralty brass, uh, aluminum brass, copper silicon alloys. Uh, you can read that over uh, in the textbook. So where do you find things like admiralty brass? Heat exchangers. So for example, these tubes here are likely, well, according to the image search, uh, that was Admiralty brass, okay? Uh, it's corrosion resistant. And, uh, you know, sometimes uh, heat exchanger tubes are copper, so those are co uh, copper uh, YouTube bundle. Um, and you can do image searches to find out what aluminum brass looks like and cupro nickel. Uh, these are materials that are used in mostly heat exchangers and stuff like that. So, screwed welded flanged connections. So, if I'm going to thread pipe, this is usually for uh, smaller sizes. So that would be uh, NPS four and smaller, typically. Uh, threading would be for low to moderate pressures. Uh, recall that you know 17, uh, 50 kPa, 1700 kPa and less. Uh, that's where we start to see threaded stuff. We don't see it above that uh, very often. Pretty rare. Uh, but the advantage is we can disassemble and reassemble threaded pipe reasonably really well and we also don't need a, a welder you know you don't have to be a certified pipe fitter or something like that to do that kind of thing now because we're threading it we cut in uh, to a depth of H, and we have to compensate for that strength reduction. 
Now flange fittings, we use it for more intermediate pressures, let's say up to 8,400 kPa. Again, we can disassemble and reassemble flanged pipe uh, uh, pretty well. Uh, little to no pipe strength reduction. But when you have flanges, insulation becomes a bit of a, a problem. You know, you've got to have boxes around everything and a little harder to insulate. But the, the premium method of connecting pipe would have to be welding. If we want very high pressures welded, it's not going to leak. But we do need certified qualified pressure welders and we need uh, registered weld procedures and all that kind of stuff. If we need something that we need to disassemble and reassemble. The... So flanges, hey. Um, so we can have a slip-on flange, we can have a Van Stone flange, which is loose. This is a recap from the fourth class. We can have a welded neck flange, so there's your weld neck. And we can also have uh, screwed-on flanges. Screwed-on flanges aren't great because you got to cut threads in the pipe. So it's really no better than, uh, than, uh, than using threaded fittings.